Welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium. Along with our partners, Shareable, the Kresge Foundation, and now the Bar Foundation, we're welcoming you to uh, another great lecture in our series. I'm Professor Julian Adjaman, and together with my research assistants, Perry Scheinbaum and Caitlin McLennan, we organize Cities at Tufts as a cross-disciplinary academic initiative which recognizes Tufts University as a leader in urban studies, urban planning, and sustainability issues. We'd like to acknowledge that Tufts University's Medford campus is located on colonized Wampanoag and Massachusetts ter traditional territory. Today, we are delighted to welcome my colleague, my friend, Dr. Kofi Boone. Kofi is Joseph D. Moore Distinguished Professor and University Faculty Scholar in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning at North Carolina, Carolina State University. Kofi is a Detroit native and a graduate of the University of Michigan, and his work is in the overlap between landscape architecture and environmental justice, with specializations in democratic design, digital media, and interpreting cultural landscapes. Kofi's talk today is The Commons, Land, Property, Information, and Landscape Agency. Kofi, a Zoomtastic welcome to the Cities at Tufts Colloquium. Over to you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Julian, uh, who's a hero of mine for my entire career. And it's just been a pleasure to get to know you and work with you uh, on a personal level, and particularly on this topic, which is close to both of our hearts. And thank you to Tufts University uh, and everyone for inviting me. So uh, with that, I'd like to share my screen. Okay, the Commons Land Property Information and Landscape Agency. As Julian indicated, I'm a landscape architect and I teach landscape architecture at NC State. And so it's a pleasure to talk about this topic from that particular lens. Uh, but as we move forward, I do also want to make some acknowledgements. Uh, make sure I've got my thing together. Uh, we are also coming to you uh, from the land of the Eno and the Shikori and the Sakoni. Uh, the Cherokee and the Lumbee, uh, we ask permission to share these words uh, about this on this land. But we also come to you from the American Southeast. Uh, the map that's on the screen is one of the early demographic maps uh, uh, counting uh, enslaved Africans uh, by county in the Confederate United States. The darker colors indicate higher percentages. Uh, the Details are hard to read, but you can also make out geography here as well. You can see very clearly the Mississippi River Delta as it moves uh, down to Louisiana, as well as concentrations in Virginia and North and South Carolina. So we are faced with the legacy in real time of these two incredible uh, traumatic incidents, the dispossession and removal of indigenous people and culture from the land, the loss of their rights, and also uh, enslaved African people to generate profit uh, for uh, colonial settlement. And so it's interesting, when I was in many of the students' shoes, these are topics that never came up in landscape architecture. Uh, but now, uh, because of the reckonings of the current day, these are, these are topics of, of major discussion. And of course, we're still faced with the pandemics, the, the public health one, of course, gripping the whole world with COVID-19 and its spread and it, all of its impacts, but which reveal deep inequalities uh, deep injustices uh, throughout the global population, but also the racial reckoning in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, which started to combine social, cultural, and equity questions as you start to face these public health pieces. And in the midst of that, the lack of preparedness from governments and agencies and the lack of support in many places, systems of mutual aid kind of came and rushed, rushed in to serve the needs of the people. Things that weren't top down, things that were determined and led by local communities and really matched the capacities of very powerful grassroots activists even to this day uh, to provide the needs that the state did not. And it begs a really interesting question because in one standpoint, this is reflective of the idea of the commons and the commons as an idea that was popularized through an article by Garrett Hardin uh, in 1968, but as a critique, the tragedy of the commons and couched in a broader conversation of environmental sustainability saying that because of people's personal self-interest, uh, we tend towards chaos, we tend towards over-exploitation and lack of management of shared resources. The fact that we share them in common means that no one is accountable, there's no structure and no rule of order. 
And so he kind of offered this as a critique of the idea of coming together and pooling resources. But of course, that was pushed back against by Eleanor Ostrom, you know, something for which she won the 2009 Nobel Prize in Economics, where she really championed the idea of local knowledge and institutional adaptation as ways of mitigating uh, these factors that are dealing with self-interest. And this quote was really interesting, crafting development enhancing institutions is an ongoing process that must directly involve the users. Instead of designing a single blueprint for all places and circumstances, officials need to enhance the capability of social actors to design their own institutions. And it's interesting, you know, honorary landscape architect, we believe that wholeheartedly when we deal with issues of community design, democratic design, and the social factors dealing with sustainability. But the idea that it is possible, it is capable for people with the right tools, the right capacities, the right focus uh, to be able to self-govern and, and self-regulate resources. And just as a personal anecdote, we got into this several years ago uh, through the design studio working in North Carolina. The eastern part of our state is still dealing with uh, very high levels of poverty and a lot of social indicators that we're trying to improve. And Henderson, North Carolina is one of those places. And that was my first contact uh, with a cooperative and working with a cooperative as a landscape architect and as an instructor. And as a part of this work, we were really challenged with a community, a legacy community that had an abundance of public infrastructure that was underutilized, that was currently vacant because of a shrinking population. And the desire for this organization, the Green Rural Redevelopment Organization, which has the very catchy uh, tagline, GROW, uh, that's literally the acronym for their name, uh, finding ways to deal with micro farming, uh, farmers who are either farming small portions of their property or uh, uh, have very small lots, for example, vacant lots in, in legacy communities, uh, to pool their resources, uh, to bring fresh produce to people in need with cardiovascular disease, other diseases that are tied to nutrition, and their limit, right, their ability to, their lack of ability to get to a certain scale and really serve more people. And so with the landscape architecture students in the studio, we did a survey of the whole county. We looked at a lot of these facilities. We started to look at public parks that were underutilized, other public spaces, other resources that are available and started to say, hey, you know, these are places of opportunity uh, to scale up and to be more effective in your work. And uh, through the engagement process, you know, went to and spent time field study with a lot of folks who were really engaged in a lot of this work. Uh, and just as a caveat, this is when uh, medicinal marijuana and, uh, and, and all of its byproducts was starting to bustle in our state. So I know this is an international call and still uh, against the law to, to, to grow and, and sell marijuana federally as a national rule. So we're not gonna show that part. Although we will say that that was a very important part of their economic strategy was using the profits from, from the growth of, of, of those products uh, for farmers to kind of scale up and work up. But what we ended up with was uh, a way of helping this community think of these facilities that were underutilized as a common resource, right? That the fact that they were not being utilized right now was a net deficit and a drag on the community an asset, even though uh, the co-op was not in a position to compensate monetarily, there were other returns on investment in terms of employment, skills transfer, uh, nutrition, uh, prevention from getting into uh, uh, hospitals and other forms of medical uh, institutions that that preventative uh, set of returns on investment constituted a shared common good uh, that actually enabled them to get access to an abandoned school and they're currently scaling up and working on their, their pieces. So, so this was my introduction to this whole topic area. But then it dawned on me that, you know, years and years and years ago, you know, I have gray hair, but I wasn't around when Central Park was developed. But Central Park is a really interesting case in terms of contested values that deal with land, that deal with property, that deal with people, and deal with what we consider the common good and therefore the commons. Uh, so Central Park in New York City, of course, you know, pioneered the American park system uh, that was celebrated you know, all across the world. Now, and then next year is the 200th birthday of Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, rightfully credited for popularizing landscape architecture. Uh, as an actual field and a, and a profession. And so, you know, all praise is due for his contribution, but, you know, we are negligent if we don't acknowledge that there were communities in the footprint of Central Park at the time that it was built and developed that were removed and destroyed and for many years, not even acknowledged. And this image on the left represents Seneca Village, a self-built African-American community of somewhere between five to 700 people uh, that was in the footprint of Central Park. 
Uh, Frederick Olmsted, there's a whole story about him in terms of uh, uh, being an abolitionist and having a very strong social justice lens and writing about the atrocities of slavery and uh, what became compiled into the Cotton Kingdom, being offered leadership of the Freedmen's Bureau based on his success in leadership sanitation uh, after Civil War. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, a serial displacer. So Central Park and Seneca Village, the Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, and on and on. This idea of vulnerable communities at that time, African-American communities coming right out of uh, enslavement and through the Reconstruction area, displaced for open spaces. And actually a contemporary conversation where a lot of communities uh, who have not been served well uh, by uh, public space and open space start to associate landscape changes the creation of new parks, playgrounds as a threat, right? It's sort of the early stage of gentrification and displacement and inspires fear. And it's not for no reason. So Mindy Fulalove, uh, who for uh, many of us was an inspiration, uh, is also a good friend, a writer of the book Root Shock, who examines the psychological impact of losing one's home place, uh, tracks this pattern of what she calls serial displacement, particularly in the United States, particularly with vulnerable people, particularly with African-American communities, uh, due to large-scale federal actions. And so there's sort of this, this broad, nebulous sense of threat in terms of uh, building wealth and finding place uh, in terms of Black communities in the United States. But there are specific policies that strategically disenfranchise African-Americans for generations. And so this repeated pattern going back from uh, emancipation all the way through uh, issues of gentrification and displacement with an emphasis on redlining and urban renewal. A lot of her work uncovered a lot of these connections in the Hill District in Pittsburgh uh, and uh, the South Bronx in New York. So these become these shocks to the system that prevent people from being in place and being settled and being able to acquire and build wealth through land and through property over time. And you know, the current disparities that we find in the United States, there are uh, uh, more recent studies that really critique it from the standpoint of the extreme wealth held by a very small component, particularly of white people in white communities skewing the scale. But generally speaking, a lot of uh, middle-class, working-class American wealth is built based on home equity and the value generated wherever they're from. And numerous studies from the Brookings Institution to many other places that have talked about those disparities based on race, the inability for African-American and Black communities to build and acquire wealth through the value of their place, even if they have an equivalent level of, of, of property and, and, and issues, it's strictly perception uh, based on uh, the perception of being inferior because of the color of people's skin, resulting in 100 to 1 uh, wealth uh, gaps uh, that we face now. And so coming back around, uh, as we are coming out of uh, summer of 2020 and all of the upheaval that occurred around the world directed at uh, you know, this, this, this horrible injustice that we saw play out in real time, mostly on social media. And what does that mean for a criminal justice system and mass incarceration and all these systems that we've kind of looked at uncritically for many, many years. You know, Julian and I were having that whole conversation about, well, what about, you know, these long-standing issues, right? This inability for communities to be in place, to not be displaced, to benefit from uh, growth and development to, and the, bu the building of their capacities at the same scale of other folks. And it led to this article, uh, uh, this idea of, is it time to revisit the idea of a Black Commons? Uh, and the Black Commons as an idea will get into towards the end of this was proposed by the Schumacher Center in terms of a term, uh, one of the founders of the community land trust model. So if you're familiar with community land trust, if not, there's a few slides later that talk about it. Um, you know, that's a real model that we've used, you know, for now uh, decades uh, to separate uh, land value and speculation from the ability of people to build assets on that land and it has its roots uh, in uh, post-civil rights actions, as well as its precedents in other places. But in addition to what the Schumacher Center was talking about, we added the layer of, well, what about cooperatives, right? Which also have this very deep uh, lineage and, and history and influence on communities and their ability to accrue and build uh, collective wealth of different types. And what does that mean moving forward? So when we move into the digital age and information, you know, what, was that, what would that mean as well? So that article kind of began that conversation. And just as a point of reflection, uh, 
uh, Juneteenth is the newest American holiday. There are a lot of politics regarding that, but its origins are in Texas uh, with African-American communities that uh, for years didn't know that the Emancipation Proclamation was passed. And in fact, they were not enslaved by uh, the letter of the federal, federal law. Uh, and the celebration that ensued after that, particularly in Galveston, Texas, in response to that. And as a tie back to uh, George Floyd, uh, because although George Floyd was, was brutally murdered in uh, Minneapolis, uh, he went to Jack Yates High School and was from Houston, Texas. And where he was from is a really important place, uh, not just in Black history, but American history and the legacy of of Reverend Jack Yates is really important. So he forms this Emancipation Park uh, sort of association, which is essentially a cooperative in 1872. And they acquire 12 acres of land in what is now Houston, all owned by black folks with the sole purpose of celebrating emancipation on Juneteenth, essentially a theme park for emancipation. It exists today. It's gone through multiple iterations and generations and resurgences, but it was the first public park in Houston. It predates the Houston public park system. So the first impetus for people right out of enslavement, uh, trying to figure out what to do next, uh, was to acquire and hold property collectively and cooperatively program it and use it for ritual to kind of celebrate so that we don't forget you know, the significance of a particular event. You know, the sad part of the story is that just as many other American cities, the park improvements trigger private real estate uh, forces around its edges uh, that then led to displacement and gentrification, even uh, in the face of the great work of Rick Lowe and other people uh, who pioneered incredible strategies to try and keep people in place that still could not withstand that. But it is important to state that as we start to talk about today, you know, the absence of, of, of vulnerable communities, black and brown populations in the ranks, the professional ranks of people who design parks and open spaces and design buildings and do urban planning and other places, that really the earliest impetus for a lot of people was to do that work. They didn't call themselves landscape architects, urban planners or other folks, but they did that. But it was also tied to the economics of it, ownership uh, and pooling resources. It's recounted in a really great book. So if you're interested in cooperatives in particular, uh, Jessica Nemhart's book, Collective Courage, is fantastic. It talks about you know, that critical moment at the end of the Civil War when you had masses of people that were now citizens of the United States you know, that had many choices about what they want to do. Uh, they decided to work collectively to build institutions, to invest in businesses, to build new towns, to build campuses, to build parks, as we just saw. You know, it was all of the things that we talk about today these communities were doing. You know, and one of my academic heroes, you know, wrote extensively about it. So W.B. Du Bois had a whole campaign about the value of cooperatives and that as a mechanism that not only just works in one place, but could be replicated in many, many, many places. For a lot of people who don't know about cooperatives, you know, uh, and a lot of people who didn't know about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, their first introduction was The Watchmen. So if you, if you have HBO, that's the opening of the first episode of The Watchmen is uh, bombing of, of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Greenwood District. Uh, that was developed through cooperatives, uh, through shared ownership uh, for either producer cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, or others. Uh, and there, it wasn't the only Black Wall Street. There were many around the country, including nearby where I live in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, Parrish Street, which was the home of NC Mutual Life Insurance Company and uh, Mechanics and Farmers Bank. Uh, up until the 1960s, the largest employers of African-Americans in the country. Uh, they were centered in Durham, North Carolina. So there's a whole history of these kinds of objects and these kinds of works uh, right before our eyes. With regards to community land trust, of course, they go way back, you know, and there are even people who talk about land trust in the context of people like, like Ebenezer Howard in the Garden City, uh, in terms of how he considered allotments, you know, in, in, in terms of that strategy. But in the 20th century, in the post-civil rights era, the late 50s and early 60s, uh, the ascendance of civil rights activists who felt excluded from a lot of the changes that were happening uh, in the country and in the government, and principal among those, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, proposed Mississippi Freedom Farms, this idea of acquiring vast tracts of land in the American South 
uh, but not for uh, uh, real estate, uh, to hold for extremely poor uh, black farmers in Mississippi so that they don't have to engage in sharecropping. Uh, they don't have to engage in uh, the risk of being displaced if say a crop fails or they're not able to, to pay a bill. And I'll try introducing the idea of the pig bank, which is what she's pictured of in front of, on the right of that picture of, you know, and now it's more of a well-known sort of concept, but you know, a pig has babies and then those babies go to, you know, families in need and those babies have babies eventually and they pay those babies back into the bank to give to the next impoverished family. They start to build all of these self-organizing structures to help people with subsistence that have now gone on to the Heifer Foundation and many other things that influence the rest of the world. But that was born out of this sense of necessity. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, Sherrod's and other folks uh, in terms of encoding the community land trust as an actual model. Uh, and the Schumacher Center is the champion of that. So they go from you know, 1967 encoding this to uh, today in the United States alone, there are 400 you know, community land trusts and it's rapidly growing and moving in international pathways. And it's a simple idea. So in commons, the idea that what's in common what's open source is the land Land is purchased for mutual benefit and interest uh, and is not sold, right? It's governed by a board made up of local people and also uh, technical experts and others who discern and determine where it should go. When people come in, they are able to build on it, to invest in it, anything that they can uh, add to it, a building, a business, uh, a community garden, and they can extract the assets or the value of that but they have no uh, control of the land. The land has no real estate uh, impact at all. And so it was a radical model at the time, uh, but is now becoming a bit more commonplace uh, and was popularized again, you know, near where you are. So uh, the great Mel King who uh, ran for mayor of Boston, but also was one of the uh, pioneers of the Dudley Street Initiative, uh, catalog extremely well in Streets of Hope. Uh, an interesting story because uh, uh, for people who have seen Boston kind of booming and thriving for you know decades now, there were parts of Boston where that wasn't true. So Roxbury, you know, the south south parts of Boston were were all uh, in the same throes as most American cities, uh, grappling with where they're going next. Uh, and so they were able to negotiate with the mayor at that time to put a moratorium on real estate development uh, within this particular community. Right. Uh, so they were able to occupy a very critical political decision moment of saying, hey, we could employ all these urban renewal policies, we could give it over to a developer and let them do what they want to do, but the community successfully advocated for no moratorium, you know, let's form a land trust of that land and hold it. Uh, and that became uh, the guts of the, of the Dudley Street initiative. Uh, and what's cool about it today is that it started with issues of affordable housing, uh, extended to businesses, but also deals now with greenhouses, with uh, consumer cooperatives, producer cooperatives, and in a recent study has resisted uh, the gentrification, excuse me, not the gentrification, uh, the foreclosure crisis that displaced a lot of folks uh, in the early and mid uh, 2000s uh, with the bank collapse, um, uh, led to massive foreclosures and that contributed to displacement and gentrification across the country. Not true uh, within the Dudley Village campus and Triangle, and they credit that in some parts to removing land and land speculation from the equation, not treating land as a product of real estate, but a land as, as a common good. Uh, moving north, uh, the Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, the Twin Cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul, historically a uh, community that was built by uh, land trust. There was an image that was associated with uh, Du Bois a few slides ago of a marketplace. That market was actually in Rondo. And so a place where, you know, people were able to move from working class to middle class rapidly uh, through cooperative uh, ownership, uh, but also a community that was targeted for freeway construction. And so you know, it's been well written, uh, redlining and urban renewal specifically targeted vulnerable populations, particularly black communities for massive restructuring. And in the case of St. Paul, it was I-94, uh, the Interstate 94, which ripped right through that historic district. What's interesting is it was born from cooperatives 
but then uh, uh, residents of that community advocating for uh, some form of reparations for the damage done started to catalog that history and talk about those narratives and why that place mattered to a lot of people. Uh, that grew up into, uh, in the short term, an, an education center, a community center that is cooperatively owned uh, by organizations in Rondo that tells that story of what was lost uh, due to that, that federal highway action. Uh, but their larger proposal uh, is uh, a cap, capping that freeway and uh, uh, creating new open space, new institutions, and new versions of the businesses that were lost uh, due to urban renewal directly on the freeway. And part of that is engaging land trusts and cooperative uh, forms of ownership to uh, prevent speculation and allow those real estate factors that are happening uh, in other parts of the country. So uh, this is underway and we're, we're watching to see what happens. And, you know, if nothing else, this uncovered for all of us a layer of information that we never asked when we deal with community groups and planning projects and landscape architecture efforts is, you know, are there cooperatives? You know, do you have a history of cooperatives where you are? Are there community land trusts? Are those things that you're interested in in terms of the toolkit of what can we really keep in common? And so this is uh, the beginnings of a map that we've been putting together uh, with our students that are documenting black and black serving community land trusts and co-ops across the country. We have about 42 of them right now uh, that all have story maps and linked information. We're hoping that we can offer this as an asset uh, to other organizations that are interested in this topic. And lastly, information. And we take for granted and sometimes discount arts and culture and entertainment and joy, really. uh, especially in these trying times. And one of the really most important things that happen when we're all just like we are right now on Zoom is, you know, how do we socialize? How do we find some way to build energy together and, and create those spaces where we can be positive and and just share each other's company in a virtual kind of way. And, you know, that's a salute to, you know, people uh, like Be Nice Club Quarantine and, you know, many of the DJ parties, the versus battles, like those are all things that, you know, attracted audiences, used open platforms uh, to share and, and that information resulted in, you know, sometimes days and weeks of the conversation and making ties. And, you know, although we don't think about that often because it seems, you know, trivial, superficial, it, it's really important in terms of the ability now to think about the digital comics, the ability to use information and engagement in new and creative ways. And, you know, a colleague and a friend who's been tying this for a long period of time is uh, Justin Garrett Moore, who for many years was a public design director for the city of New York, now has moved on to the Mellon Foundation. Uh, and this is a picture of him in his hometown, he's from Indianapolis. Uh, and in particular, his grandfather was a part of an incredible cooperative uh, many years ago that dealt with farming and, and food security, particularly during the, the Great Depression. But he's looking at sort of the conditions of his community in Indianapolis and trying to find ways to uh, sort of connect and mobilize people with scarce resources uh, to pull them together for mutual benefit, sort of honoring that legacy, but sort of in a digital way. And I came up with this model that's really interesting called Urban Patch, you know, which is essentially uh, an online platform, crowdsourced, crowdfunding, a la carte for what the community has been asking for and what they've been doing. And they started small with street trees and signage and uh, volunteers to clear vacant lots and make them habitable. But they've been scaling up, right, as they started to increase their footprint and their, their role. This is, you know, the return of a local grocery to that particular neighborhood. That was done in part uh, due to that crowdsourced work of bodega and a community garden that provides the produce that's sold in the bodega. Uh, that's some of his New York influence, I guess. I'm not sure if they had bodegas in Indianapolis before you went to New York, but you know what I'm saying. But it's even gone international, right? So Urban Patch has been funding the development of affordable housing in Rwanda. Uh, uh, these are some of the, the most recently finished units. And what's cool about it is that in addition to building high quality housing for people in need in that part of the world, it's also seeded the development of skills training and development. So brick masonry, uh, electrical work and water work, all of the skilled trades that are required to not just build but maintain infrastructure are also being funded through this sort of distributed digital model. The people who funded this stuff 
uh, from that neighborhood in Indianapolis to these new housing units in Rwanda may have never been there. And maybe that doesn't matter from a certain point of view, uh, if in fact they know the social benefit of what they're investing in. So this ability to use the digital platform to rapidly uh, expand this idea of the commons is something that, that I, I do pay attention to and I do look at. So with that, I'd like to stop and say thank you and uh, be happy to answer any questions or get into any discussion that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Kofi. Uh, excellent presentation. And um, yet we do have some questions coming in. Um, so Tom Viles is asking, do you have a view on the suggestion that the commons are three dimensional? In other words, the commons are not merely common lands and parks, but also the enjoyment of fresh air and light, which can be enclosed by the erection of uh, neighbouring large structures that deny light and fresh air to vulnerable communities, for example, heat islands, urban canyons, and so on. I think that's a great, great uh, way of looking at it. Uh, I've never coined it as three-dimensional, but I absolutely agree that, you know, all these things in common for our health um, and, you know, I'll, Tip of the cap to uh, my good friend Julian, who helped me understand uh, capacities and the need for uh, uh, helping communities build their capacities uh, to determine their own sort of just and sustainable futures. Uh, anything that's that's a part of that uh, could be considered a part of the comments. Yes. Great question. More questions, please. We're uh... Privileged to have Kofi. I want to, I want us to max out on the time that he's here. Kofi, I'm going to ask you. Um, so you know, you've come up through landscape architecture. I've come up through geography and urban planning. You know, we're at similar phases in our career, and we've really come to a point where we're looking through a racial equity lens at very similar things, and yet the histories of both our professions are steeped in privilege and slavery. I think of the, you know, I grew up in the UK at visiting stately homes. We called them stately homes. These places like um, Downton Abbey, they're all over. And nobody really spoke about where did the money come from? Well, we know where the money came from. How in a, in a typical degree in landscape design, how do you guys deal with that? Because, you know, we're really trying to adapt the urban planning curriculum to be cognizant of the, well, what I've said, urban planning is the spatial toolkit of white supremacy. And mm. in many ways, our landscapes are imprints of white supremacy. I mean, what's, what's your take on that? How do you deal with that with students who are coming in? I just want to do nice designs. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, um, for, so this is a way of backing up. The last time I saw a professional survey from American Society of Landscape Architects where licensed landscape architects self-reported the kind of work that they did, um, still somewhere over 50% that did nothing but private residential uh, gardens and yards. And so there's still a large component of our profession that is specifically tied to the needs of people who can afford our services, who are aware of landscape architecture, who are really looking at ways to improve their private property, but there's a growing percentage that's dealing with public realm, right? So the streets, the parks, the neighborhoods, where the food is coming from, how do I protect myself from flood? And so when you start to do that analysis and what we have tried to do is to introduce this idea of social vulnerabilities as a part of it, saying that we're not all equally exposed to the benefits or the risks that were tied to the environment. And there are real historical reasons why some people are and aren't. And it doesn't always work, I'm gonna be honest with you. Some people, they come through the program and they're just like, you know, whatever, you know, I still wanna make pretty things, but there's an increasing percentage. And what's cool about it is that um, uh, a lot of the pressure to, to learn and understand that stuff has been coming from the global students, the students from other countries, right? So for a period of time, people were coming, you know, would say to get the prestige of an American degree, you know, and go home and practice. Uh, yeah. But because of particularly climate change, Right. Uh, you know, we have really talented students from places like Bangladesh and other places where it's like it's real. Right. If you don't deal with uh, issues of vulnerability, exposure, tie that to history, it, it's a life and death situation for them. And yeah. so that in some ways, that globalization of the conversation has made it uh, it doesn't seem intuitive, but has made it easier to talk about. Oh, well, then let me learn about these vulnerabilities in American context. And when you deal with that, you're, you're, you're confronted with race just right off the bat. Right. Okay. 
for some reason or other, uh, I can't see the question uh, piece. Uh, Caitlin or uh, Perry, do we have uh, more questions in there? I'm seeing some in the chat. Uh, Could yeah, we have so, quite a few. Yeah, yeah. I, I just can't see them. While I'm trying to find the questions, uh, cherry pick, Kofi. Pick the ones that you want to answer. All right, let's see. Um, how can local and state government support projects of the Black Commons through financial investment? Are there other ways? That's a really good question. That's from Johnny. Uh, you know, uh, what, what we probably should not do is what just happened with opportunity zones. Uh, so if we're familiar with that whole piece uh, in the United States um, uh, was a way essentially to allow people to use real estate investment to recover losses in capital gains uh, over a 10 year span. Uh, so uh, it emerged, I think with the best of intentions, but has been exploited for the rich. And so for example, Hudson Yards uh, in New York City, you know, which has per square foot, some of the most expensive real estate, you know, in North America, is an opportunity zone and people exploited that benefit uh, in order to essentially extract wealth. Uh, but I think that there are other cases. So, for example, where we are, uh, you know, uh, cities are own a lot of property, right? So uh, either uh, public housing or, or other things that are really under city purview. This has come up. I've mentioned Durham before, Durham, North Carolina. This has come up with the old police station, for example, the old site of the police station. Well, what do you do with it next? So it's it's transformed the conversations of who's included in terms of what the city really needs, and it's offered a sort of a platform for people to talk about these issues. There are parts of it that will be held in common, that won't be a part of real estate, and won't be part of that kind of uh, sort of cycle of investment. And so I think looking at municipally owned land and property uh, is a great opportunity. In Atlanta, I think they have decided to do that uh, 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 to literally see uh, sitting on land over to community land trust and over to uh, cooperative organizations. So that's a resource I think that's in every state. Great, thanks Kofi. I'm, I'm back now, I can see the chat. Um, <laughs> and I'm pleased to see a huge, how many people are at the Brown House watch party? There must be, are there 15 of you in there, 10? Great, excellent. Um, so they're asking, what are some of the things to consider when looking at the governing structures of community land trusts? Yeah, there are a lot of concerns. I think when it was originally conceived, and the Schumacher Center is open source. So if you Google it, um, they offer a lot of great resources of you know, how to start one and how does it work. And there are many other resources online. I think what they brought up, which I think uh, makes people pause a bit is that you would expect a community land trust, a governing structure, a governing board to be 100% local people, right? 100% people who have a direct proximate relationship to that particular land. But they said not to do that, uh, that there is a series of rotating uh, chairs and their board uh, that are for you know, outsiders and technical experts, because even back in the 60s, they saw the benefit of having people have different points of view. The majority is almost always local people, Right, so if it turns out that there's a tug of war in terms of what's most important, they wanted to privilege, you know, people who who had that lived experience and that connection to the land. But up to thirty percent, in some cases, are you know technical experts like ourselves or uh, people who can build networks and connections to other organizations, help them advocate. Uh, and I think that that structure probably makes some sense. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Chris. What are your thoughts of what's happening in Germany, uh, our zoning predecessors, uh, in the seizure of corporate land to redistribute it for public goods? And how can we learn from it? That's a tough question. Uh, I'm going to plead ignorance uh, to the situation in Germany, so I don't want to misrepresent what's happening. Uh, but I can say uh, uh, where we are in the United States, if there's any parallels, uh, there's a whole question about eminent domain and its use here, you know, uh, where if uh, a government can uh, prove uh, that there's a, a benefit to the broader community, they can take people's land uh, uh, for that benefit. What are those benefits? Well, currently in our own backyard, it's a freeway connection. Uh, there's they, the, the, our local, our local our state, 
Department of Transportation just filed a lawsuit against a private property owner who doesn't want to sell their property to allow the connection of a huge interstate freeway. And it's led to this gigantic conversation of like, do you really need this connection to this large interstate freeway? Is it going to unleash you know, a, a scale of development that will displace people? And is this person holding out some form of resistance uh, to that particular kind of thing? So I think that you know, the lesson that I might offer from American context is that uh, eminent domain, uh, which would be our parallel, is very difficult because coming to a consensus of what's the common good and removing that from the growth pressures, the growth imperatives, all those things we know are tied to real estate is really, really hard. So people in Germany should watch out. Great, thank you. Um, Hilary Knoll from Mithun, which uh, you know, Kofi, and yeah. uh, I know Deb. Say hi to Deb for me, uh, Hilary. Um, can you share more about the network of cooperatives and CLTs and how we might learn more and connect other emerging organizations? Yeah, you know, there's, um, it's, it's at the tip of my tongue and I can't remember the name, but there are a number of organizations where that's really their whole thing is building this uh, giant database and knowledge base of who's doing what. I think that uh, there's so many situations that I've faced, maybe you have as well, where a community kind of is starting to build up from the ground up and they understand that there's a need. And, and in some cases, they feel like they have to reinvent the wheel. You know, they have to start over from scratch and don't benefit from that broader network. Um, and I would say in the early 20th century, it was much more uh, prominent, you know, where leading scholars and, you know, uh, uh, folks that were trying to build these communities were very uh, prolific in terms of sharing and connecting and through churches and faith-based organizations, through uh, you know uh, various forms of enterprise, it became a thing. So what I would like to do, uh, specifically answer that, I think the benefit of that, just to get to the chase, is uh, in a global world, you know, where we're all networked, uh, maybe you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Maybe there are lessons that can be learned and transferred, translated uh, between people peer to peer. You know, maybe there are. Uh, uh, networks that then build connections to access resources to improve what you're doing locally uh, and um, and a way to report right uh, what what you've been doing to contribute to that broader pool moving forward. So there are a lot of benefits, but I, I will share uh, with Julian and the folks after the call the links that I referenced. It's, it's, it's escaping my mind right now, but there's some really good ones out there. Sure. When you mention networks and I think of supply chains and I think of my fellow Brits in lines at the gas or as they call petrol stations, the Brits didn't seem to understand that we're in a networked world and that pulling out of Europe was not a good idea. But this is just the beginning of the Brits finding out in very painful ways uh, the folly of, of the decisions they make. Um, political point there, folks. We often regard Olmsted uh, in a negative aspect because of displacement. Can you speak to his legacy as an abolitionist? How do we reconcile learning about this historical figure from an honest point of view from both sides. Mm. Yeah, you know, uh, Olmsted's really complicated. Um, and I'm dating myself, but I was in grad school in landscape architecture in the 90s. And at that time, that was when minimalism and sort of a resurgence of modernism uh, was, was happening in our profession. Uh, and which case all those people hated Olmsted, not for these reasons, they saw him as a social engineer, right? They thought that landscape architecture was not meant to uh, literally uh, 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 engineer uh, social interactions, which now seems kind of crazy, but that was sort of the tenor of things. So people were critical from a totally different point of view at that particular point in time. And then the resurgence that's happened in Olmsted's popularity, which I would actually attribute to uh, uh, the great firm Turnscape in China and the rise of Kung Jin Yu, uh, and his work on the idea of what's called the sponge city concept of using green infrastructure as ways to deal with stormwater management at the city and regional scale in these fast growing Chinese cities as really the, the beginning of that conversation of the United States, I think, abandoned in some ways the idea of a large, connected, uh, multifaceted, multi-layered project that Olmsted was common for, huge park systems the Emerald Necklace in Boston, like these ideas of landscape can operate at these larger scales and deal with these multiple benefits. The return of that was these fast-grown places globally. And like, oh man, we got to recover Olmsted's legacy and figure that out. 
So there's been some definition and redefinition of what Olmstead was really about. But what we do know is that, you know, a, a, a son of a relatively wealthy family, man of leisure, traveled a lot, happened to be in Europe when they were opening up royal grounds, right, royal lands for public use. Uh, also traveled through the South and wrote under a pen name uh, for what became uh, the New York Times. Those letters uh, collected uh, in the book, Cotton Kingdom, if you want to hear his own observations of it, uh, offered uh, leadership of the Freedmen's Bureau, which sounds crazy uh, looking back, but who refused that, but based on his success with the Sanitation Commission, right? So uh, the idea of how do we deal with the healing process coming out of the Civil War, uh, in his own words, an abolitionist, but also in his own words, did not believe that uh, Black people and African Americans had the same intellectual uh, capacities as white people. He said that, right? Did not hire African Americans, right? So not only did he displace places like Seneca Village, but didn't even hire them. So the both sides thing is hard. Um, I think the fair part of it is he deserves his credit for being a key advocate from everything from the National Park Service to the popularization of American parks in general. The idea that it's no longer just gardens in people's backyards, but it's entire systems that can deal with sanitation, that can deal with ecology, that can deal with a lot of other things. But he also had a very strong social attitude. He and John Dewey and that whole ilk were dealing with this massive influx of European immigration in American cities and saw what they were doing as a way to kind of civilize, in Olmsted's words, literally civilize uh, uh, these disparate groups of people to Americanize them. And so, you know, it's, it's unfair sometimes to critique people out of their time. But I think it is fair to say that just because he said he was an abolitionist didn't mean that he saw African-Americans and Black people as equals and, and did not uh, really work to provide opportunities through the landscape to empower uh, Black people and Black organizations. Great, right, thanks, Kofi. Um, Catherine Piasecki, to me, the idea of shared commons slash cooperative movements has radical economic implications and challenges many of the inherent goals of capitalism. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these spaces within the context of capitalism versus socialism. That's a great question. Um, I have a good friend uh, who teaches at Pratt, um, uh, Kilian Riano, um, he's an architect, and he hosted a session about uh, this exact topic several months ago. I'm gonna try and find the link and I'll send it along because there's some really good conversations in there. And in a nutshell, it was really looking at capitalism in terms of our practice, um, in terms of how we practice as professionals to, to influence land. We're in this frame of real estate, right? So we're already kind of playing catch up there in terms of uh, a lot of what we do being measured by return on financial investment on land. Uh, we generally work with clients, you know, and those clients, you know, pay like a fee for service kind of relationship. And, you know, as much as people are critical of capitalism, people are still trying to find a way to subsist and to live uh, through the, 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 the skills that they have, the technical training they receive, there's some sort of uh, recompense there. So, so it's complicated in that way. I, I agree that the commons fundamentally challenges those roots of capitalism. Uh, I do think that uh, the examples of the black commons were the attempts to carve out spaces within that capitalist infrastructure, spaces where you could work in common. So do I foresee like a complete overthrow of capitalism uh, predicated on commons? Possibly, but, but I think what's probably more possible are, are, uh, are, are these pockets, these growing and more connected pockets where space is claimed for things in common. This falls apart, for example, with climate, uh, anything dealing with climate, because there's no boundaries you can put on climate. But it does allow for uh, maybe some overlap with more finite things. So, you know, food production, uh, mobility, you know, uh, housing, access to health care, uh, even education, open source in terms of uh, uh, gaining access to the skills and being able to retool to be able to, to, to provide it for yourself. So. So I, I, I unfortunately don't share the revolutionary lens on it. I don't see an overthrow of capitalism anytime soon, but I do see growing and more connected pockets where 
things that are in common can scale up and, and actually uh, match and maybe even supplant the capitalist model. Thanks, Kofi. Uh, Joel says, I'm skeptical of claims uh, for an architecture of the urban commons. Seems all architecture and architects can do is to come into situations where these projects are underway already and augment or facilitate their coming into being in conjunction with other processes and institutions. But I'm curious to know whether designers feel they can do more than piggyback on common in initiatives and forces that are already latent in the city. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think it's one size fits all. So, you know, my introduction to the topic in terms of first person was, you know, a really small uh, uh, farming cooperative in Eastern North Carolina. And so bringing technical assistance and support to bear to help them scale up, right? Uh, which is different. It's almost treating them like a client as opposed to adopting some of the cooperative frameworks that they have. So it's opportunists, like for sure. But I think that there are more. And I think that um, the complexity of some of the challenges that we're going to be facing moving forward, uh, there are constraints based on how we traditionally uh, work uh, that I think will force us to think about how we practice in some fun fundamentally different ways. You know, as a part of that uh, session that I referenced uh, that was um, uh, about you know capitalism and that kind of thing. There were a number of architects from Barcelona in particular uh, who have managed to develop professional practices on the cooperative model. So horizontal forms of hierarchy and leadership, uh, very careful attention to the network that they use to source and supply uh, the, the work that they're doing, the type of engagement that they have and the way that they decide what clients uh, they need to work with. But I think they said that it was uh, at least a city, if not a national mandate, that they do so, which is to say, to get back to the beginning of you know, the, the remarks with Ostrom, uh, you know, who rejected sort of top down stuff and said that people can self organize and do it. In our case, uh, in terms of uh, professional uh, uh, sort of technical experts in the built environment, you know, we would benefit from some policies and rules that encourage us to do that. And I think that that was really integral to why these firms, particularly in Barcelona, were able to, to move forward and, and be healthy and be prosperous and still uh, reflect through a cooperative model. Great, Kofi. I think this will probably be the last question from Nathan Klima. Uh, you spoke just now about eminent domain as a power wielded by government that has great potential to displace people, especially those in marginalized communities. What are some ways in which eminent domain can be used by community land trusts for public good? Example, DSNI. Yeah, I mean, that's an example. Um, I think what I'm seeing more now are uh, easements and overlays. Uh, we're dealing with a project right now uh, in Western North Carolina and an area that has very rich cultural heritage that some of the key players that created the heritage here made direct reference to aspects of this landscape, right? As a part of why this landscape matters. So they recount the plants that they saw, and, you know, what was happening in these creeks and they're sharing these incredible stories of, of why this place is valuable. And so we're concerned about how do we hold that in common, right? For if not perpetuity for as long as possible. And we're lucky that we have a few entities here, uh, the Conservation Trust in North Carolina and a few other places are like, oh yeah, well, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a different version of a land trust, but these conservation easements are tools that we use. You know, say for example, you wanna maintain agricultural character in the place where you don't necessarily have the economics to compete with major farming. They will, you know, partner to find the resources to purchase and hold that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I've been skewing more towards the, the overlay and easement approach as opposed to the eminent domain approach. Um, but, you know, DSNI brings up, you know, a great, a great counter to that. And where we are in our backyard, one of the other oldest uh, and still running and successful community land trusts is during community land trusts. We had the same, same model as DSNI. So. Well, Kofi, we could go on. This is a topic that uh, is of great interest to us. Please forward any of your uh, your links. Uh, can we uh, give a, a UEP Cities at Tufts uh, round of applause for Kofi, please? 
Thanks, Kofi. Uh, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next week, folks, we have Melissa Peters, and I see Melissa is in the room. Melissa Peters is an, a UEP alumna, and uh, she's now um, with the City of Cambridge, and she's going to talk about some interesting new challenges uh, in planning in Cambridge and other places. So until next week, thanks very much again, Kofi. Mate, it was great. Thank you.